Section two of the Vortex Blaster by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. How? The big lensman's query was skepticism incarnate. It can't be done, except by an almost impossibly fortuitous accident. You yourself have been the most bitterly opposed of us all to these suicidal attempts. I know it. I didn't have the solution myself until a few hours ago. It hit me all at once. Funny I never thought of it before. It's been right in sight all the time. That's the way with most problems, the chief admitted. Plain enough, after you see the key equation. Well, I'm perfectly willing to be convinced, but I warn you that I'll take a lot of convincing. And someone else will do the work, not you. When I get done, you'll see why I'll pretty nearly have to do it myself, but to convince you exactly what is the knot. Variability, snapped the older man. To be effective, the charge of explosive at the moment of impact must match, within very close limits, the activity of the vortex itself. Too small a charge scatters it around, in vortices which, while much smaller than the original, are still large enough to be self-sustaining. Too large a charge simply rekindles the original vortex, still larger, in its original crater, and the activity that must be matched varies so tremendously in magnitude, maxima and minima, and the cycle is so erratic, ranging from seconds to hours without discoverable rhyme or reason, that all attempts to do so at any predetermined instant have failed completely. Why, even Kennison and Carding and the Conference of Scientists couldn't solve it, any more than they could work out a tractor beam that could be used as a tow-line on one. Not exactly, Cloud demurred. They found that it could be forecast, for a few seconds at least, length of time directly proportional to the length of the cycle in question, by an extension of the calculus of warp surfaces. Huh, the lensman snorted. So what? What good is a ten-second forecast when it takes a calculating machine an hour to solve the equations? Oh, he broke off, staring. Oh, he repeated slowly, I forgot that you're a lightning calculator, a mathematical prodigy from the day you were born, who never has to use a calculating machine even to compute an orbit. But there are other things. I'll say there are, plenty of them. I thought of the calculator angle before, of course. But there was a worse thing than variability to contend with. What? the lensman demanded. Fear, Cloud replied crisply. At the thought of a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the vortex, my brain froze solid. Fear. The sheer, stark, natural human fear of death that robs a man of the fine edge of control and brings on the very death that he's trying so hard to avoid. That's what had me stopped. Right, you may be right, the lensman pondered, his fingers drumming quietly upon his desk. And you are not afraid of death, now, even subconsciously. But tell me, Storm, please, that you won't invite it. I will not invite it, sir, now that I've got a job to do. But that's as far as I'll go in promising. I won't make any superhuman effort to avoid it. I'll take all due precautions, for the sake of the job. But if it gets me, what the hell? The quicker it does, the better. The sooner I'll be with Joe." "'You believe that?' "'Implicitly. The Vortexes are as good as gone, then. They haven't got any more chance than Boscone has of licking the patrol.' "'I'm afraid so,' almost glumly. "'The only way for it to get me is for me to make a mistake, and I don't feel any coming on.' "'But what's your angle?' the lensman asked, interest lighting his eyes. You can't use the customary attack. Your time will be too short. Like this. And taking down a sheet of drafting paper, Cloud sketched rapidly. This is the crater here, with the vortex at the bottom, there. From the observer's instruments, or from a shielded setup of my own, I get my data on mass, emission, maxima, minima, and so on. Then I have them make me three duodeck bombs, one on the mark of the activity I'm figuring on shooting at, and one each five percent over and under that figure, cased in neocarboloy of exactly the computed thickness to last until it gets to the center of the vortex. 
Then I take off in a flying suit, armored and shielded, say about here. If you take off at all, you'll take off in a suit inside a one-man flitter, the lensman interrupted. Too many instruments for a suit to say nothing of bombs. You'll need more screen than a suit can deliver. We can adapt a flitter for bomb-throwing easily enough. QX, that would be better, of course. In that case, I set my flitter into a projectile trajectory like this, whose objective is the center of the vortex there, see? Ten seconds or so away at about this point, I take my instantaneous readings, solve the equations at that particular warped surface for some certain zero time, but suppose that the cycle won't give you a ten-second solution. Then I'll swing around and try again, until a long cycle does show up. QX, it will sometime. Sure. Then, having everything set for zero time, and assuming that the activity is somewhere near my postulated value, assume that it isn't, it probably won't be, the chief grunted. I accelerate, or decelerate. Solving new equations all the while? Sure, don't interrupt so. Until at zero time. The activity, extrapolated to zero time, matches one of my bombs. I cut that bomb loose, shoot myself off in a sharp curve, and zweet powie, she's out, with an expressive, sweeping gesture. You hope. The lensman was frankly dubious. And there you are, right in the middle of that explosion, with two duodeck bombs outside your armor, or just inside your flitter. Oh, no. I've shot them away several seconds ago, so that they explode somewhere else, nowhere near me. I hope. Do you realize just how busy a man you're going to be during those ten or twelve seconds? Fully. Cloud's face grew somber. But I will be in full control. I won't be afraid of anything that can happen. Anything. And, he went on under his breath, that's the hell of it. QX, the lensman admitted finally, you can go. There are a lot of things you haven't mentioned, but you'll probably be able to work them out as you go along. I think I'll go out and work with the boys in the lookout station while you're doing your stuff. When are you figuring on starting? How long will it take to get the flitter ready? A couple of days. Say we meet you there Saturday morning. Saturday the 10th at 8 o'clock. I'll be there. And again Neil Cloud and Babe the Big Blue Ox hit the road, and as he rolled the physicist mulled over in his mind the assignment to which he had set himself. Like fire, only worse, intra-atomic energy was a good servant, but a terrible master. Man had liberated it before he could really control it. In fact, control was not yet, and perhaps never would be perfect. Up to a certain size and activity, yes, they, the millions upon millions of self-limiting ones, were the servants. They could be handled, fenced in, controlled, indeed, if they were not kept under an exciting bombardment and very carefully fed, they would go out. But at long intervals, for some one of a dozen reasons, science knew so little, fundamentally, of the true inwardness of the intra-atomic reactions. One of these small, tame, self-limiting vortices flared, Nova-like, into a large, wild, self-sustaining one. It ceased being a servant then, and became a master. Such flare-ups occurred perhaps once or twice in a century on Earth. The trouble was that they were so utterly, damnably permanent they never went out and no data were ever secured, for every living thing in the vicinity of a flare-up died. Every instrument and every other solid thing within a radius of a hundred feet melted down into the reeking, boiling slag of its crater. Fortunately, the rate of growth was slow, as slow, almost, as it was persistent. Otherwise, civilization would scarcely have had a planet left. And, unless something could be done about loose vortices before too many years, the consequences would be really serious. That was why his laboratory had been established in the first place. Nothing much had been accomplished so far. The tractor beam that would take hold of them had never been designed. Nothing material was of any use. It melted. Pressers worked after a fashion. It was by use of these beams that they shoved the vortices around, off into the waste places, unless it proved cheaper to allow the places where they had come into being to remain waste places. 
A few, through sheer luck, had been blown into self-limiting bits by Duodec. Duodec Apply Latimate, the most powerful, the most frighteningly detonate explosive ever invented upon all the known planets of the first galaxy. But Duodec had taken an awful toll of life. Also, since it usually scattered a vortex instead of extinguishing it, Duodec had actually caused far more damage than it had cured. No end of fantastic schemes had been proposed, of course, of varying degrees of fantasy. Some of them sounded almost practical. Some of them had been tried. Some of them were still being tried. Some, such as the perennially appearing one of building a huge hemispherical hull in the ground under and around the vortex, installing an inertialist drive and shooting the whole neighborhood out into space, were perhaps feasible from an engineering standpoint. They were, however, potentially so capable of making things worse that they would not be tried save as last-ditch measures. In short, the control of loose vortices were very much an unsolved problem. Number One Vortex, the oldest and worst upon Tellus, had been pushed out into the Badlands, and there, at eight o'clock on the tenth, Cloud started to work upon it. The lookout station, instead of being some such ramshackle structure as might have been deduced from the Lensman's casual terminology, was in fact a fully equipped observatory. Its staff was not large. Eight men worked in three staggered eight-hour shifts of two men each, but the instruments. To develop them had required hundreds of man-years of time and near miracles of research, not the least of the problems having been that of developing shielded conductors capable of carrying truly through five-ply screens of force the converted impulses of the very radiations against which those screens were most effective. For the observatory, and the one long approach to it as well, had to be screened heavily. Without such protection no life could exist there. This problem and many others had been solved, however, and there the instruments were. Every phase and factor of the vortex's existence and activity were measured and recorded continuously through every minute of every day of every year, and all these records were summed up integrated into the sigma curve. This curve, while only an incredibly and senselessly tortuous line to the layman's eyes, was a veritable mine of information to the initiate. Cloud glanced along the sigma curve of the previous forty-eight hours and scowled, for one jagged peak, scarcely an hour old, actually punched through the top line of the chart. Bad, huh, Frank? he grunted. Pretty bad storm, and getting worse, the observer assented. I wouldn't wonder if Karlowitz were right after all. If she ain't getting ready to blow her top, I'm a Zimbriskin Fontima's maiden aunt. End of section two.